Well, we come to the end of Advent today, and uh, we, we finally get to Mary. And uh, Mary is just a, just a common young girl who is visited by an angel. We know this story. And she's told when the angel Gabriel visits her that she will be overshadowed and that she's going to become pregnant. And you, you, We're not going to read that, but you know how that story goes. And she just doesn't understand how that could be. And even though she doesn't understand the how, um, she still receives this mission from God, this place that God has put her in. She says, let it be. You know, let, let it be to me the way that you want it, Lord. And so then after that, that time, it says that Mary leaves Nazareth that is up north in Galilee, and she travels down south to Judea to see a relative of her, Elizabeth. And Elizabeth is an older relative, and Elizabeth has also, in her old age, uh, an impossible thing has happened. She's with child, and she's had no child before. And when Elizabeth sees Mary, it says that the, the baby that she's, carry, that she's carrying jumps. She's filled with the Spirit, it says, and the baby jumps. And the baby is John the Baptist, we learn later, and he's just six months older than what Jesus is. And then uh, Elizabeth blesses Mary and says that this is the handmaiden, and that she is in fact carrying the Lord, is what she tells her. And then Mary sings a song. Um, she's obviously moved in the spirit, and she kind of has this prophetic song that she sings out. And that's our text this morning. It's from Luke 1, 46 to 55. And Mary said, My soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for he has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is upon generation after generation toward those who fear him. He has done mighty deeds with his arm, he has scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their heart. He has brought down rulers from their thrones and has exalted those who were humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent away the rich empty-handed. He has given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy, and he, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his descendants forever. Well, you know, there's <clears throat> strikes me this year that there's something that's kind of when we get underneath all the layers of the Christmas story, there's something that's kind of subversive about Christmas. And subversive sounds like a bad word, but really to subvert is to overthrow by indirect means. And subversion isn't a frontal assault. It's, it's kind of a stealth campaign is what that is. To subvert something means to turn it upside down. And I think that Christmas of God coming down to the earth in the person of Jesus Christ is really subversive. It's an overthrow by indirect means. And our, our Christmas stories talk about that all the time. Uh, if you just go through the Christmas stories, the secular ones that we have this time of year, they're all kind of tell the subversive story. I mean, the most famous of all is the Christmas Carol, Charles Dickens. You remember that rich and, and powerful Scrooge is brought to his knees by ghosts that visit him. And while poor, uh, lowly Bob Cratchit, uh, he rises above the circumstances and he has true joy while old Scrooge is perplexed. Or what about Rudolph? You know, Rudolph is the reindeer that can't join in the other reindeer games, okay? He's a loser. Uh, but yet his, his, his problem you know, as he's got this red nose and things in life turn around so that his red nose turns out to be the saving thing. And, and so he's the lowly one that is exalted in his disability. Did you ever think about that? It's just a story of grace. Or, or the, the story about the folks in Whoville. We were watching some of that last night. The Grinch thinks that he's ruined their Christmas. Uh, in the original story, he steals all their stockings and their food and but then the tables turn, and, and in the end, you know, Grinch is carving the roast beef, and, and the lowly have been exalted, and Grinch, who thought he had everything figured out, is brought down. And, of course, the classic good old Charlie Brown, you know. Everyone tells him that he has to have this huge production for a Christmas pageant, and the most beautiful Christmas tree ever. 
but he refuses to go along and he buys the saddest looking tree that he can find. And with a little help from Linus and the book of Luke, right, he discovers the meaning of Christmas. And God chooses the least likely tree to show his glory. And that's why there's something kind of subversive about Christmas. There's something underneath it that's going to turn things around. It, it overthrows the established order of things. It turns things upside down, but we really shouldn't be surprised by that. It's, it's always been that way. We're going to discover today that the birth of Jesus Christ was the most subversive act in human history. And this plan of God to overthrow the world system Okay, as a human in the person of Jesus Christ, is not something that just God thought up out of necessity late in the plan. It was there from the very beginning. Okay, the plan of salvation was, was always there. In the book of Ephesians, Paul says, in Ephesians 1 4, he says, God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless in Him. So last week we were talking about creation a little bit. And before that ever happened, God chose us in Jesus Christ. That salvation plan has always been there. And then God shows us, uh, shows us that plan early in the Bible, in the Garden of Eden. Remember after the man and the woman had disobeyed God, and God says, don't eat of this tree of knowledge of good and evil. They, they wanted to decide what was right for themselves, so they ate of that tree and then they're banished from the garden. And as God banishes them, uh, in the process, he pronounces the consequences of what this means on their life by disobeying him. And some of the consequences are to the serpent, the tempter. And this is in Genesis three fourteen to 15. I bet you never thought the Christmas story was in Genesis. It's here. It says, The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, Cursed are you more than all cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity, strife, conflict, between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. So there we have back in Genesis at the beginning of the fall, you know, where the serpent, or Satan of old, as he's, we're told finally in the book of Revelation, attacks the seed of the woman on the heel, and the seed of the woman bruises him on his head. And that's the picture of the conflict between Satan, the, who's the ruler of this world, and the enemy of God. And that's the conflict between him and Christ the king and the ruler of the new kingdom. There's always going to be conflict there. Evil's always going to fight good. There's, there's never going to be peace between evil and good. I, that's something for us to, the, difficult for us to accept sometimes. There's always going to be these two kingdoms in conflict until the end. One's going to stand for truth. The other's going to ex, exist in deceit. One's going to be love. The other is going to be hate. One's going to be mercy. The other is going to be revenge. It's like oil and water. They just don't mix. The kingdom of this world that, that lives in power and greed and revenge and hate and envy is at war with the kingdom of God. And it began all the way back there in the garden. And I, I, I know what I'm saying today isn't your normal Christmas message on the Sunday before Christmas. But if we look at the plan from the beginning and, and the clues that are given along the way, we find that the coming of Jesus Christ is actually a declaration of war against evil. See, what the world sees is not really what's going on. The world sees Christmas as a time of just peace and goodwill and wonder and miracles. But at the heart of things, that's not what, what's happening that night. Jesus was, as we would say, being dropped behind enemy lines, okay? He, he was on a black ops mission, a stealth mission, and only a few knew about it. Only the shepherds know about it, and later these astrologers from Babylon that visit, the wise men as we like to call them, they know about it, but no one else knows. It's quiet. It's a secret who he is. He's on a mission. 
It's subversive. C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity said, enemy-occupied territory, that's what this world is. Christianity is a story of how the rightful king has landed, and you might say landed in disguise, and is calling us to take part in a great campaign of sabotage behind enemy lines. So Mary's song that she sang that we just read for us is called The Magnificent. It, it shows that, that she is one of the first humans to receive this message to understand that Jesus has been sent to this world. And the song starts off, and we can just kind of imagine the emotion that she's in as the, the Holy Spirit falls on her. And I, I just kind of see Mary, you know, like a Mideastern young girl would be, whirling around the room with her arms up high, singing this song of praise to God, you know. It starts off, and, and it says, My soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in my Savior. And you can just feel this emotion as, as her her cousin has declared to her that she has, in fact, been chosen to carry the Son of God. But then she tells us why she's so excited. She says, for he has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. And she can hardly believe that. God's noticed her, and not only her, but others as well. And she says, and his mercy is upon generation after generation toward those who fear him. You see, to us, Mary's famous. Everybody knows who Mary is, right? But she's not famous then. She's just a young girl. She's a nobody. She's born to a family that is just a real common peasant family. And God doesn't choose her because she's so smart or she's so pretty, okay? Or she has so much talent. She's chosen because she's willing, okay? And because she is a nobody, God chooses the unlikelies. God chooses the unknowns for his mission. The common saying is that God moves in mysterious ways, but really God moves in very unexpected, unexplainable, undercover, surprising ways. And this is a mission because his war against evil does not use power or talent or resources or celebrity status. His war against evil uses common people, unknown people. And that's why God chose Mary. And she knew it, I think. Her song was saying, God saw me. God chose me, little me. I'm nobody. And God chose me. Her song gets even more expressive of what's happening. She says in verse beginning in verse 51, he has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their heart. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, and he has exalted those who were humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent away the rich empty-handed. So those that were on top of the world system, you see, are demoted, and those who are on the bottom are brought up. Those who are humble, who are low, who are left out, the passed over, the unknown people of the world are chosen by God and lifted up. This, this isn't just a song of praise. This is really a protest song is what this is. This is a kind of in-your-face Satan message. For Satan has deceived in the world system humans to believing that, that we are never really loved by God. We're never good enough for God. We're never going to be perfect enough for God. We're never going to be devout enough for God. <clears throat> We're never anything enough for God. That's what Satan convinces us. But the Son of God in the womb of the unknown young girl meant that God was declaring war on the deceiver. That whole system of who's the most powerful, who's the best looking, who's got the most money is being overthrown. The world loves famous celebrities. Beyonce, for her last world tour, uh, had a list of demands uh, at all the venues, and it was leaked out. This is embarrassing for her, I think. Listen to this. All crew members must just wear 100% cotton clothing. It's no big deal, right? 
Alkaline water must be chilled to 21 degrees and served with $900 titanium straws. Bathrooms have to have new toilet seats put down and only red toilet paper. Hmm. Hand-carved ice balls should be made after each show to cool her throat. Only hand-carved ice balls. Newly refurbished luxury dressing rooms with enough space that would, you know, handle a sports team. That's what every venue has to do for Beyonce. She goes around the world because she's so special. And the thing being known is that you don't have to have money to think that you're special. You know, ordinary people like us can make outlandish requests. But in sharp contrast, Jesus came to earth demanding nothing, nothing. What he got was just a cattle trough. Jesus entered enlisted common people uh, to affect his overthrow of the world system. He didn't live in a palace, a small town, no-name town. It's just Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth, it was said? His father was a construction worker. Jesus was a construction worker until he was age 20. When he began his ministry, he chose 12 men who other rabbis had overlooked. They weren't smart enough and good enough to make it into other rabbi schools. But Jesus chose these 12, and they were just fishermen, and some of them were tax collectors. That meant that they were kind of extortionists in their day. One of them was a thief. He associated with all people. He had no class rules, not just those who could help his status or help his career, but he would associate with any and everyone. It made no difference. He went to dinner parties with people that no other Jew would sit and eat with. No one was beyond him. He was the savior of all people. When he was on his world tour, you see, his only requirement was that you be a human being that was good enough for him. He told his followers that they could do what he did. It wasn't just about him. He said, in fact, you will do greater things than I do, John 14, 2. So what he started, we're supposed to finish as his followers. We're supposed to live the same way that he lived. We are his kingdom people. Now, we might wonder today as I'm talking about this war that's been waged by the kingdom of God on evil Well, how's that going, Don? Look around the world today. It doesn't seem like the kingdom of God might be winning this war, right? Things can look pretty dark, can't they? I mean, all you got to do is watch the news every day. And man, is it getting worse or is it getting better? Part of that is because bad news just travels so fast. I mean, it gets suppressed. What if the, the news that was reported was the good news, too? Well, what if we reported the good things that happened? Somebody gets shot and makes the news, right? Somebody gets loved, doesn't make the news. Expect, except the little special things that they do this time of year. What if the news carried things like the man mows the yard for his elderly neighbor? <laughs> what if that made the news? What if everything that was good made the news for a while? Uh, an 85-year-old shut-in makes a jam cake for, for the pastor, Okay, what, what if that made the news? What if a father asked the son to forgive him and restores that relationship, and that's on the news that night? The father asked the son to forgive him, and they got the family back together. What if the wife forgives the husband for being a jerk all weekend? What if that made the news, see? What if an eight-year-old boy stands up to the bully in the class who's picking on the class nerd? What if that made the news? Well... There aren't enough books, there aren't enough websites, there aren't enough hours on TV shows or channels to carry all that news. You and I both know it because it happens all the time, millions and millions of times. Only the bad news gets the press. Christmas isn't just about love and peace. Christmas is also about justice, about the secret army of God, the kingdom people bringing about God's justice every moment of every day. We just can't see it. The world doesn't recognize it as being important, as being newsworthy. A couple of scriptures as we come to the end here. 
1 John 2.17, John says, The world is passing away and also its lust, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. The world system is ending. James, brother of Jesus, in James 2.5 says, Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, God chose the poor people of this world to be rich in faith and to possess the kingdom which he promised to those who love him. Christmas is about war on evil. It began with a young girl named Mary when she accepted God's plan to lift up the humble and the unnoticed. And since this war began 2,000 years ago, we may not be, we are not aware of the battles that have been going on, the battles that have been won, because we live with the benefits of what has happened before us in those 2,000 years. So I started thinking about this, of the things that have changed in the world since Jesus was born 2,000 years ago. You know, children are thought of now in our society to be, to be so prized. We all prized our children, right? That wasn't always the case. Oftentimes, children weren't named for a long time because, you know, if you happened to be born and you had some deformity, you might be left out beside the road to die. It's the way it was for children. Until the one came along and said, you know, the kingdom of God is such as to these. The world's changed a lot in their attitude of the, of the children. Jesus was never married. And yet the early church had more converts of women than men because Jesus elevated the stature, the, the state of women in the world. He, he gave them dignity. Okay? That has changed. Jesus never wrote a book. And yet, his call to love God with all of our mind, all of one's mind, would lead to a community that really has a reverence for learning. You know, most of the colleges and universities were started by the church. Yale, Princeton, Harvard. Don't talk about that anymore. That's where they came from. University of Kentucky came from College of the Bible. Oh, we got a little history in there, don't we? He never held office or led an army, and yet the movement he started would eventually mean the end of emperor worship. He changed the way that politics happened. We have that phrase that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. Where we get that? Jesus. The Roman Empire to which Jesus was born could be Splendid, but also cruel, especially if you were weak for the malformed or the diseased and the enslaved. This teacher said, as you have done it unto the least of these, you have done it unto me. So the idea slowly emerged that every person was worth the same and that the suffering of every person, every single individual human being matters and that those who are able ought to help those who are not able came from Jesus. Hospitals, orphanages, we're just not getting to the point. Isn't it strange that in just in the last few years, it's no longer St. Joseph Hospital, but it, they changed the name to some generic secular name. Most of the hospitals come from the church. Humility, which used to be a, considered a weakness, scorned in the ancient world, became symbolized by the cross, forgiveness moved from being a weakness to an act of moral beauty. No things have changed. We are winning this war on evil. It's slow. It's stealth. It's undercover. It uses the common person to do that, person by person. And at Christmas, we should remember that it was the beginning, and the world may still be a dark painful place for many, but God's war on evil is advancing though the millions, through millions who will receive from him the mission that he wants to change the world through us. So here's my question for you today. Is God calling you to sing a song with Mary? Is God calling you to receive a mission into your life that you are willing to give your life for the, for the humble, for the, for the unknown people in this world are you willing to be a humble and an unknown world a humble and an unknown person in this world to give your life like Mary gave her life I guess we answer that every day don't we 
I guess we answer that question with every decision that we make. I'm, am I willing to be least so that God might be greatest in me? Am I willing to take my weakness and let God use me as one of his broken vessels, earthen vessels, to fill me with his spirit? That's the message of Christmas. As deep cries out 